Good evening. Um, on behalf of the friends of Harriet Beecher Stowe House, we want to respectfully acknowledge that the ground on which we stand are traditional Miami and Shawnee lands. We extend our esteem and gratitude to the indigenous people who call this place home. Welcome to the Harriet Beecher Stowe House's first session of the 2022 Power of Voice discussion series. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about who needs American voices. Um, our sponsors for the Power of Voice season series are School Outfitters, bringing learning spaces to life, and also Hindman, an internationally recognized fine arts auction house. We are grateful for their support. You can find information on both of those uh, companies linked to our, this page on our website. <clears throat> You'll also want to check out our website for information on more discussions, lectures, and current exhibits. We are open for tours. We uh, starting this weekend. We actually we're going to postpone uh, two days and not be open tomorrow and Friday, but we will be open for regular hours starting on Saturday. So Saturday 10 to 4, Sunday 12 to 4, and then next weekend we'll start back up with, um, you know, on Thursdays. So uh, let's see. Let's get started with our discussion. We'll go for about an hour, maybe a little bit more, and mute yourself when you're not speaking, but feel free to virtually hand raise or to just to jump in when you're ready to contribute. Tonight's leader for our discussion, of course, is Dr. John Getz from Xavier University, and I'm going to let him take it away. Yeah, and especially tonight, since it's just me, feel very free to jump in uh, at any time. Uh, well, let's look at the timeline first. And the first thing I have to do is point out a mistake that's in it. I got Harriet's marriage in the wrong year. Well, I was moving things around and highlighting things. Uh, it moved up to 1834, but it actually is 1836. So minor mistake, but significant in Harriet's life, obviously. So take you made me that. double check that, John. I, when I saw that, I was like, I've always thought it was 1836. Surely John's not wrong. <laughs> and you were right. So, uh-oh. <laughs> so my mistake. And I didn't even read the timeline, which is <laughs> shows why I didn't catch that mistake. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's, let's start with the real stuff. And uh, um, this question of who needs American voices, uh, skip down to 1820 because you get the first version of that coming, uh, well, uh, the most articulate blatant version of that coming from uh, British writer Sidney Smith, who said, in the four quarters of the globe, who reads an American book? And he went even further on that. There's more to the, to the quotation. Uh, he said, who goes to an American play or looks at an American picture or statue? What does the world yet owe to American? Now he's going on after physicians or surgeons. What new substances have chemists discovered? <laughs> or what old ones have they analyzed? What new constellations have been discovered by the telescopes of Americans? And what have they done in mathematics? Who drinks out of American glasses? Or eats from American plates? Or wears American coats or gowns or sleeps in American blankets? Well, it's quite a litany of things he was expecting out of us that we apparently weren't delivering, at least to his satisfaction. He did make one very telling point when he said, finally, under which of the tyrannical old governments of Europe is every sixth man a slave whom his fellow creatures may buy and sell and torture? Other side of uh, Sidney Smith's comments. Uh, so, well, what state were we in at this point? Uh, there had been some talk of the American character. And if you go back to 1782, there's Hector St. John de Crevecoeur, uh, a French guy who came to America and, and lived here for uh, quite a few years and then eventually went back to France. Uh, he wrote letters from an American farmer, and he's the guy who coined the melting pot metaphor for the first time. He said, here individuals of all nations are melted into a new race of men. Uh, well, not exactly all nations, because he enumerates those nations, and they all turn out to be Western European nations, uh, English, Scotch, Irish, French, Dutch, Germans, and Swedes. 
Um, but at least he had the metaphor going. And he did criticize slavery, too. So the outcry against slavery is there, you know, from the very beginning, even when we start talking about an American character, which is why Krev Kerr is only cited as one of those who, who, who gave voice to the notion of an American character. So you can see the birth, uh, the birthdays of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Harriet Beecher Stowe there. Note that both are New Englanders, and that's uh, significant, I think, uh, because Walt Whitman isn't. You can see him being born in 1819 there on Long Island. He's a New Yorker. Long Island, Brooklyn. Uh, he, was a, he was an Easterner, but not, and not a New Englander, and a very different sensibility, I think, in part because of that. He was also, uh, he grew up in a Quaker family, very different from uh, Emerson and, uh, uh, and uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, okay, a point for Harriet. At, in 1829, Catherine and Harriet Beecher organized a letter writing campaign on behalf of the Cherokees, who were in danger of being, and turned out they really were, uh, taken off their ancestral lands in the East and taken out to the uh, Indian Territory, what would become an, a decade later, the Trail of Tears. And Emerson would, uh, if you skip ahead to 1838-39, you see Emerson publishing a letter in defense of the Cherokees protesting their, uh, their removal. So when we talk about an American literature beginning to form, or who needs American voices, these were uh, uh, voices by Native Americans and by Black writers uh, were not usually considered in that discussion. I put some of them in here, like William Apess in 1829, publishing, he was a Pequod who did a good deal of writing uh, and uh, on behalf of, uh, well, just telling his own story, but also on behalf of the Native American cause. Uh, and then if you look down later, you, of course, you'll see Frederick Douglass's narrative in 1845 and many other freedom, what we call today freedom narratives were being published uh, uh, at this time too. Though when I was studying American literature in college and in grad school, they weren't really part of the discussion. Uh, the, uh, it was the writers, some of the writers we're going to talk about tonight, who got, and then as well as Hawthorne and Melville and others who, who got most of the focus at that time. So the charge is, is there an American literature? Who reads an American book? Some people conceded Ben Franklin. Yeah, he's okay, but that's about it. Well, uh, it, uh, one answer was, what do we have? that they don't have. I mean, the argument against an American literature was we don't have ruins, okay? That sounds kind of crazy. Who needs ruins? Well, ruins often, <laughs> they indicate history. They indicate a history that goes back centuries and centuries. Think of Wordsworth's tint poem on Tintern Abbey, uh, uh, an, an abbey that had fallen into, uh, into decay, but he wrote a poem about it affecting his imagination. Uh, so it was the idea of the history, an aristocracy, a highly developed so, uh, system of social class. Um, and uh, that was the, uh, that's what, uh, that's what, um, that's what uh, the people who made the, the textbooks that I learned from uh, thought about American literature. But of course, we see it very differently today. And I want you to understand that when we're talking about the emerging American literature, there are many voices involved here. Uh, and, and we're not, we're only looking at three of them tonight. Okay, so Harriet, well, let's go back, go to 1832. And we see, again, one of the answers, we don't have ruins in America. What do we have? We have nature unbridled nature, wide sweeps of nature. And Chris, I don't know if you can get the, those two Hudson River paintings, the Thomas Cole paintings up right now. There it is. That's the first one. That's the one uh, I want to talk about first. Uh, this is called Kindred Spirits, and it's by a, a poet or a painter named Asher Duran. The two kindred spirits he's picturing there are Thomas Cole, 
uh, the painter, who's the one on the right, and uh, you have to look very carefully for them. Uh, Thomas Cole, the painter, and then William Cullen Bryant, who was a newspaper editor and poet, fine poet himself, and an anti-slavery activist. Um, but look how they're pictured. They're not sitting in a drawing room. They're not really the, the main focus exactly of the painting because you have this huge background, this big sweeping background. That's what Cole tried to capture in his paintings. That's what Bryant tried to capture in his poetry. And it was one retort to the charge that we don't have any, uh, uh, any American literature. We don't have ruins. Well, who needs ruins? We've got nature. And in fact, he wrote a, uh, Bryant wrote a poem to Thomas Cole. Uh, he said, and this was Cole who was getting ready for a trip to Europe. He said, thine eyes shall see the light of distant skies. Yet, Cole, thy heart shall bear to Europe's strand a living image of thy native land, such as on thy own glorious canvases lie, lies. Lone lakes, savannas where the bison roves, rocks rich with summer garlands, solemn streams, skies where the desert eagle wheels and screams, spring bloom and autumn blaze of boundless gro groves. So that's the, that's the image that Cole painted. That's the image he's taking with him to Europe big sweeping scenes. And in the last part of the poem, uh, Cole, uh, Bryant says, fair scenes shall greet thee there where thou goest, fair but different. Everywhere the trace of men, paths, homes, graves, ruins, from the lowest glen to where life shrinks from the fierce alpine air. Now the ruins become a negative because it shows the human handprint on everything. Whereas we've got this wild unbridled nature. Uh, he says, gaze on them till, their till, till the tears shall dim thy sight, but keep that earlier, wilder image bright. So that's the, uh, that's, I don't think we need to look at the other coal painting. It's just a quick example of the kind of broad sweep. Yeah, there it is. The broad sweeping landscapes. And if you look carefully closely, you'll find farmlands and little touches of these paintings. There was an exhibit at the Taft Museum of Hudson River paintings a couple of years ago. And uh, you got a, a, yeah, they tend to be big paintings too, large, you know, four feet, three feet, and they're good sized, uh, good sized landscapes. Okay, well, maybe that's enough to know about the, uh, about the timeline. Uh, uh, quick summary, Harriet writes, Uncle Lot in 1834, um, Emerson in 1837 gives the speech and publishes what becomes the American Scholar, and uh, Whitman does not come out with Leaves of Grass, he's a younger guy, doesn't come out with the first edition of Leaves Oh, okay. Well, let's time to look, I think, at the first question and see what you have to say. I've been talking a long time here. So first question is, if you had been a reader or writer in the U.S. in the first half of the 19th century, would the readings by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Emerson, and Whitman have made you care if the new country developed this distinctive literature? What do you think? Who cares? Who does need American voices? I'll chime in here if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think maybe it's the Americans that need American voices. Um, I, I like that, that Harry Beecher Stowe starts out saying um, something about her introduction being a breeze of patriotism. And then um, with Emerson, his phrase where he says, events, actions arise that must be sung. Those things kind of sound like a big, like, a, like she says, a breeze of patriotism, like something kind of pushing Americans to do something for themselves. Now, so those two would have made me want to, you know, to answer your question, to care if we developed a new distinctive literature. But Whitman, his um, starts off talking about loafing and, you know, it goes <laughs> much more individualistic. And so to me, that might've turned me off back then that, you know, it's not the same patriotic push. So that's what I thought. 
Okay, anybody else? Would be either impressed or kind of mad about whether we had, an Amer had American voices or not. What good are they? Really, I mean, what, you know, we did develop an American literature, okay? What, it, what, does it, what does a literature do for a country to have kind of a national literature? Go ahead, Amy. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So I'm going to, well, first of all, absolutely adore Walt Whitman. So I was enjoying the, the song of myself. And I think in a strange way, I'm going to disagree with the previous speaker in that, yes, it's very internal, and he discusses loafing and inviting his soul to lean and loaf at his ease. But in number 16, he talks about one of the nation of many nations. So it points out e pluribus unum smack dab in number 16. Um, and of course, just I was reading to a friend of mine to encourage her to come tonight, um, number 52. And I'm like, oh, that's where yawp comes from. And it's a barbaric yawp because it's modeled after a hawk, which would have you know, Europe has different flora and fauna. So all of those images that Emerson or that uh, Whitman pulls from, um, I think are uniquely American in a lot of ways. But I, I just kind of wanted to say regarding your question, Professor, I mean, we're a nation that started with a declaration of independence. We're a nation that started with words. So I think having a specific and a unique American voice is important as a nation, it's part of our identity. Oh, and we also pull so much on our constitution, which all these hundreds of years later, people are constantly quoting, misquoting, stretching, interpreting, flexing, not flexing, however you want to look at it. Like it's those words that are so powerful to our identity as Americans that you know were created a couple of hundred years ago for us. So I don't know if that helps. Oh, that's, that's uh, well said, yeah. There was a critic, oh yeah, Kara, go ahead. Okay. I think Emerson, um, at the end of his, it says, a nation of men will for the first time exist because each believes himself inspired by the divine soul, which also inspires all men. And so I think he's saying, you know, that that's what will happen. Like Americans with their writing and with their work can inspire men because of this uniqueness that we have as Americans. Does that sound like the beginnings of American exceptionalism? You took the words right out of my mouth, Don. I was getting, that just sounded like when she said that, I, I was thinking, hmm, you know, and, and we are different, but then so is every other country different. <laughs> so, you know, but that's how, that's how, you know, we have a distinctive literature. You know, our literature is different than South Africa is different than France, is different than, you know, Israel, you know, all different because we live in different places, we have different culture. Um, so, so the idea of developing a distinctive literature, I think, I feel like that's something that just happens naturally. I don't know that it's something that we really had to work it or did we i don't know well, there were a lot of writers talking about <laughs> working at it uh melville in moby dick you can hear him kind of sounding the call that this is you know these are people coming from all over the world onto the Pequod, and this is kind of like america it's there's it it's a theme that runs through a lot of the writers in the first half of the 19th century now, whether they needed to or not, I mean, some people would say, well, why didn't they just write the literature? Why are they talking about it all the time? But it, it was a, a popular topic. I, I to get back to the point about exceptionalism for a minute. There's a- Hang on, <laughs> hang on John. The, the other, hang, yeah. hang on, John. Barbara, I think, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. I wanted to say um, from the beginning, America was such a derivative place. I mean, it was derived from England. It was perhaps to some extent, um, there were issues influenced by Ireland um, and the fight between Ireland and England. Um, 
when the American Revolution was fought, there were all these people coming from other places, uh, Lafayette, and um, I never pronounce his name uh, correctly, but I think it's Kuskiusko coming from Poland. So there were all of these kind of rivers flowing into America. And, and of course, we don't even talk that much. And we're currently being discouraged from talking about um, the African influence, the Native American influence. There were all of these strands coming from elsewhere and America was not itself um, a separate entity. And it had this need to be this separate entity. Um, and it did it through its, what I guess many would declare would be an expression of genius um coming through the writers but and i remember uh reading in history about uh the war of 1812 and how uh america at that point had a very huge inferiority complex and it continued to have an inferiority complex um so there was definitely uh this need to be distinct to be brilliant to uh, be the residents of genius. Um, and I, I mean, I'm going out on a limb here, but I think some of those insecurities have not yet settled, even in 2022. Yeah. I'm done for now. <laughs> okay. Well, there, I mean, the, the, point you, the points you're making are really important and they kind of lead to the, uh, maybe the underside of this notion of creating the national literature because it depends on who's admitted to be a part of that and who's not. And it also can be put to good use because, uh, not necessarily good use, but practical use in the interests of manifest destiny. As the country expanded west and took more and more land away from Native Americans, uh, now here we are, this great, wonderful American culture. Well, wait a minute, there were all sorts of American cultures here before we were, but... Yeah, um, then, quite ancient ones, actually. Yeah, and, uh, but th if you create this new sort of post-colonial American culture, at the same time you're colonizing the former, or the, the current... And you're yeah. doing unto others what you dare not anybody do to you. Yeah, so it's a it's a double double sided thing. I mean, I think it's you know it's great. I teach literature. I'm glad people wrote all these books. But you also have to ask the question: Who's not in them? Who's not invited to the party? And how is this uh, this new? But I I beg to differ in a way. I mean, I believe it was the 1830s um, that where you have the kind of emergence of all these slave narratives uh, yeah. that influence, very strongly influence Harriet Beecher Stowe in her writing. Oh, yeah. And where she almost, it could be argued, claims the slave narrative as her own. Where she, in, in a sense, ventriloquizes that voice. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're still left perhaps at the same stone contemplating that stone and what is its megalith. But, I mean, it even goes, you can even go further than that, thinking about the Monroe Doctrine at this time, where the U.S. was extending its hegemony over Latin America, saying to Europeans, keep out, no new European colonies there. Uh, so, you know, And also I, Africa with Liberia. Yeah. yeah, so it's all part of, I mean, I don't think that all these writers were cynical. But all sorts of different uses, some of them good and some of them uh, nefarious. And in the, in the literature books that I studied in the 1960s and 70s, when I was in college and grad school, those black voices were not heard. They were not part of those texts at that time. Uh, and uh, the Native American voices were not in there either. So uh, the question of, an, of what is the national literature, who gets to identify it and claim it, I think is always a, a conflicted question, a vexed question. 
Uh, well, let's go to the second question here and let's focus on Harriet for a little bit. This is Harriet Beecher Stowhouse after all, after all that I'm talking to you from. So uh, do you think that the alternative Harriet offers in Uncle Lot, and I know I didn't ask you to read the whole piece, but some of you may have, but I just was hoping you'd read the first few paragraphs. Uh, uh, offers an alternative to the, to the literature of the old world because she dismisses Italy, Greece, the odor and languor of the Orient, France, England. They're too romance-like, too obviously picturesque for me, she says. Um, and then, you know, she's gonna tell the story of Uncle Lat, who by the way, is based on Lyman Beecher's uncle, uh, mm -hmm. the man who raised Lyman Beecher. Uh, uh, Lyman's mother died uh, when he was very young and he was raised by this Uncle Lot Benton. Uh, this kind of curmudgeonly crusty old New England farmer. And uh, so this character is based on, uh, is based on, on the guy who raised, uh, who raised Harriet's father. Um, what do you think? Does a story about an ordinary New England farmer match up with the grandeur of the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome and all these things that she's dismissing in the first couple paragraphs of this story. What's the justification for saying, we don't need that stuff. We've got Uncle Lot the farmer, just kind of a simple, crusty, grouchy, but good-hearted farmer. Is that a better story? So I have to admit that I'd never read Uncle Lot before <laughs> two days ago. <laughs> I'm not sure why, um, but I started reading it as like, this is not at all what I was expecting. I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but it, it was very, um, couldn't tell who the protagonist really was. It kind of kept skipping around. And I was like, well, who's this story really about? It's called Uncle Lot, but he doesn't seem to be the main character. So I, I don't, I, it's, it was kind of just like, here's a slice of what's going on. And, you know, I'm just going to tell you about this family. And, oh, by the way, one of them is angelic. Kind of reminded me of little Eva, but that was much later. So, um, yeah, but, similar, really. yeah, so it was just a, you know, kind of a, what, what does an American family look like? And it wasn't very, you know, maybe it was a description of, I don't know if there's a typical American family because Harriet's family had a ton of kids and they only had two, but it, you know, it was, it, it, I, I don't know. It was more or less just a, this is what the family's like kind of story. Anyone else? It reminded me very much of Little Women. As I was reading it, I, I thought, you know, Louise May Alcock could have written this. Um, same, same tone of voice. Um, and Little Women was written, you know, 30 years later. Um, I don't know what that, I don't know what that means, but uh, it struck me. Well, it's an interest in ordinary people, supposedly ordinary people doing ordinary things, which is, and she says, it's not heroic. You know, I'm not, not interested in these grand uh, heroic stories. I'm just going to tell you about an ordinary, you know, kind of run-of-the-mill farmer guy and, you know, learn about him. A lot of women writers did that. Uh, Joan Hedrick would probably trace that to the parlor literature that helped to shape Harriet's, uh, you know, the, the sharing of letters, writing things for the semicolon club. This was actually written for the semicolon club originally and published about a year later. Uh, but it's an alternative. And again, it's an attempt to have an American voice diff doing something very different from what uh, Europeans were doing with grand stories or Sir Walter Scott's novels were very popular at this time about knighthood and chivalry and all this grand stuff. Uh, she says, no, let's just do something very simple. Uh, uh, very homely. She says, it's my own New England, the land of deeds and not of words. 
It's an interesting distinction. We're supposed to here um, uh, Americans are people of action, not people who just talk a lot. The land of fruits, not of flowers. And then the, one of these lines really struck me. The land always spoken against, yet always respected. The latchet of whose shoes the nations of the earth are not worthy to unloose. Anybody reference there? She's got it in quotes, so she's kind of cueing you that it's a it's a quote from someplace. It's what John the Baptist said of Jesus uh, when he was baptizing him, or at some point he said, "There's going to be somebody coming along the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose." And she's kind of rewritten this to be about the U.S. Simple people may be like Lyman Beecher, but again, you're getting that current of exceptionalism, I think, starting to come in here. Uh, even with, uh, even with a, uh, an innocent little story like this. Um, so, Anne Emerson said, uh, uh, I mean, she's doing something that Emerson would call for a couple of years later. I ask not for the great, the remote, the romantic, what is doing in Italy or is Greek art or Provençal min minstrelsy. I embrace the common and sit at the feet of the familiar below. Give me insight into today and you may have the antique and future worlds. So he's kind of encouraging that, that sort of thing too. Uh, and, and as Bart said, I think before this, she calls this patriotism. I think there is a little bit of flag waving going on in here to, uh, 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 in, in an unlikely place really. I have a question. Um, was she using the characters George and James to mean like George as in like the old school, like old world kind of learning? Like his, he went away for traditional learning in college and then came back, but, but was weak and ended up dying versus James, who's this hardy guy who is really into himself and thinks he can do anything, which is like the United States. Was she like <laughs> using those two characters to be the old world and the new world kind of thing, or no? Well, maybe. I, uh, what I would think about that is that maybe she's commenting on the New England clergy in general. Uh, books have been, or at least one important book was written some years ago about the, the waning power of the New England clergy in the first half of the 19th century and the mainstream Protestant denominations. And uh, they just seem to have less and less influence, be less forceful. And I think maybe what she's suggesting is let's renew the clergy with this younger or this other guy who's more worldly and lively and has a lot of energy. We don't need just this sort of frail scholar who's fading away. We need somebody who's really out there getting people fired up. Maybe okay. like my brother Henry Ward Beecher, <laughs> maybe yeah, somebody, um, uh, somebody like that, somebody who would be, uh, who would rejuvenate the, the clergy and bring people back to church. Uh, okay. Just being a scholar isn't enough. So I, I, that would be my take on that. But it's, yeah, it's sort of an, an older generation, even though he's, you know, they're the same age roughly, but old, an older generation, an older style of preacher versus a newer, more revivalist, more enthusiastic okay. one. Okay. Kara's got a question here. No, just a comment that it was at the time of the Second Great Awakening. Mm hmm So. And so, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say, I thought Barbara's hand was up a minute ago. Did you have something that you wanted to mention? And then Amy's after, And then Amy's next after that. It was. I don't know if it's going to take us off on a tangent, but I was... I was thinking about the kind of gender dynamics and wondering what men at the time were writing about um, versus this kind of departure or statement coming from Harriet Beecher Stowe at this time. So if that takes us far afield, <laughs> I withdraw the question until perhaps it will become relevant later or maybe it won't at all. Uh, but that was what I was thinking. I was. I was just kind of looking at the gender dynamics of then at this very rather early time. Yeah, I think uh, I think it'll become very relevant when you talk about Whitman, 
uh, because he does some of the same focusing on very small specific scenes. And we'll talk a little bit more about art uh, in relation to Whitman too when we, when we get there. Uh, it, there was a growing women's readership for fiction at this time in the US. And uh, a lot of women, the, the best selling writers in general in the first half of the 19th century were not Hawthorne and Melville and Poe and the people who show up in the anthologies. They were women who wrote uh, novels that people would have dis today might dismiss as sentimental or domestic, uh, but they were selling a lot. There was a, a new market there. So, so you mean before the 1850s and the scribbling women, there was this market of women writers? There were, I mean, that was oh. Hawthorne complaining about the damn mob of female scribbling women or whatever, yeah. But I uh, thought that was the 1850s. Well, maybe by the, maybe it really caught on in the 50s, but I think there were, well, the, there, was, uh, there was a woman writing up in Michigan, Carolyn Kirkland in the 1830s, who wrote about her experience on the frontier up in Ann Arbor. Uh, in that area. Um, and I think there were other women writers starting to do the kinds of things that, that Harriet's doing in here. And Harriet was, you know, was writing some more of that stuff too. Well, thank you. Yeah, their right. popularity came in the 1850s. All right, okay. Amy. Oh, yeah. Well, so it was just interesting looking over the third paragraph. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I think there's something universal in this simplicity. I mean, that's like, there's a sentence that could just easily be out of our town, where it talks about the inhabitants were all a respectable old steadfast family who made it a point to be born, bred, married, die, and be buried in the self same spot. Like, I almost think Thornton Wilder used that exact line, but it's been a while since I've looked at our town. And it also kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Ethan Frome as well, just in the like, New England starkness story you know like they're quote simple stories but they're not and I think they borrowed a lot from if they were aware of this story they borrowed from it if they weren't they must have it must have just seeped into the DNA of later writers in America it seems to me I don't know so, I want to interject for a second because I had forgotten it but when I was reading this three days ago I was like this just sounds like the beginning of our town and I, I literally had that thought as well. So there must be something there. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's the, stage, the stage manager guy who, who, you know, I was in our town in high school, but I was oh. like one of, I was one of the, I oh. wanted, I wanted to play the lead, but no, I was not apparently oh. that good. I'm sure you would have I was one it. of the dead, I was one of the dead people in the cemetery. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you would have rocked it though. <laughs> Well, that you I, Amy, what you're talking about is American regionalism and that emphasis on particular parts of the country, certain character types that you might find there. Uh, and that's a tradition that's getting, Stowe is one of the originators of that. It gets carried on throughout the 19th century by Sarah Orne Jewett, who was an admirer of Stowe. And then in the 20th century by Willa Cather, and you mentioned Wharton, and, and Ethan Frome and uh, Summer, books like that. They focus on a particular, uh, and there are other regions too. We're talking about more of the writers who focused on the East or, the, or New England, but there are obviously, there is the current of regionalism that runs through, uh, runs through American literature. And again, maybe is what Twain said. Somebody asked him in the last half of the century, the 19th century, somebody said, well, what's the great American novel? Is it, uh, have you written the great American novel? And he said, there will be a hundred great American novels from, from the various regions of this country. Dan, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just, just very simple. I didn't think of Old Town. I thought of Delhi. <laughs> I, I, that's what I thought of. Honest to God, I thought of Delhi. My, my wife comes from Delhi and honest to God, the first thing that hit me with there was, well, this is a description of of uh, you know a central part, a regional part of, of Cincinnati. So just thought I'd add that in. You don't have to go into stories to 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 find this. <laughs> the universality of story. Okay, well let's let's switch to Emerson for a while, and I don't know if Emerson is sometimes challenging for uh, for readers if you haven't done much with him before. I 
Uh, does anybody want to talk about your experience of reading just these couple of pages by Emerson? Or if anybody braved the whole of the American scholar? Any particular challenges or that he posed to you? Well, well, John, you know, you, in the last couple of years, you've got me reading some uh, Emerson by just just doing it. And uh, of course, his, uh, his book, Nature, is a, a whoa. Uh, he's, he's a slow read because he's so deep in every sentence, it seems to me. So, um, uh, but I think he is a very deep and informative person. Phil philosophically, I think he's just a, he's, he seems to me to be more of a philosopher than it does to be a, 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 an English uh, literature person. Well, he's not great on transitions <laughs> that you learn in English composition. Always make a smooth transition to the next part of your, the next sentence or the next part of your paper. He doesn't do that because he believed that each sentence should sort of contain the whole, uh, the whole of his thoughts, each and all. Uh, so it's, you do have to just kind of experience sentence by sentence and then maybe, maybe you fit it all together afterwards. But uh, that, that's just my advice about reading Emerson. Enjoy the sentences, experience those, and then try to see how they all fit together. Uh, but but the, the question was, do you see any dangers in the individualism that underpins Emerson's plea for a national literature and the American scholar? because he's basing it on individualism. I hope everybody noticed some of that, especially in, in that closing paragraph. Emerson's been inspiring to lots of people. He inspired Thoreau and other transcendentalists. I can remember Many years ago, when Nelson Rockefeller was running for president, he quoted Emerson in one of his speeches. Uh, a lot of his sayings have become popular. Hitch your wagon to a star. That's, he's the one who said that. Um, he certainly influenced Whitman profoundly. Uh, and he has some great lines. Our day our long friendship to the learning of our friends draws to a close. In the big finish, we have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. I mean, there, there are no clearer statements of the need for a national literature than that. He's calling for it right there. But it's based on individualism. The yeah, uh, the thing, one of the lines that got me was that um, it's in that last paragraph. And I did read the whole thing, although I didn't understand the force of it because it was one of, it's, it's something that, like you said, you have to read every sentence 10 times to really get it. And I was, didn't have time to do that. Um, and I can't imagine sitting there listening to him, you know, yeah, give this speeches. speech and, and catching anything in it. But anyway, the, the line that got me was, um, I lost it, that if the single man plants himself indomitably on his instincts and there abide, the huge world will come round to him. So you sit there and do your thing and the world's gonna come to you. Well, yeah, that's individualism, but you know, if nothing mm -hmm. else, you know, you do your thing, else is gonna figure you out. And if we're talking about the formation of American character, American literature, that individualism is something that's very ingrained, I think, in, um, in certain aspects of American culture, the more powerful aspects uh, of the culture. John, did you see Kara's comment on the side? No. Um, Thought he was saying we are not very intelligent at the beginning and then he went into that individualism <laughs> and so forth felt it came later in time so yeah kind of at the beginning it was like oh there's all these grandiose things i'm not going to do that we're not going to do that we're more basic than that or something I... but i think let me look at your comment kara or do you want to, why don't you tell us what you, what you said? 
I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I was actually getting ready to type some more. So I just thought that the idea of the whole individual instead of the country came a little bit later on. I said um, everything was, you know, more of these well, you're still like, we are in this together type mentality. And so I don't know when I, I guess the whole idea of, human, of American exceptionalism and the individual maybe came together at about the same time. Um, but I think too, it's interesting where right after what I think Trinity Mary said um, in that last paragraph, it then goes on to say, um, it was like, is it not the chief disgrace in the world not to be a unit? Blah, blah, blah. And then it says like, but to be reckoned in the gross and the hundred or the thousand of the party and the section to which we belong and our opinions subjected geographically as the north or the south, I think, you know, he, he, and this might be some transcendentalism coming out, but like, we should be who we are because of who we are rather than where we're from. And so I think, you know, he stood up against the Amer Mexican American War and he stood up against um, slavery. And so I think that idea of maybe it's not individualism in a bad way, but it's more of individualism in the way of like, you should stand up when you see something wrong. Like, you can't just go with it. Um, and I think maybe, Honestly, I didn't think about it until I literally was just saying it because I was still confused up until, I mean, I'm still confused, but I think maybe that's more of what he's saying rather than this idea of just American exceptionalism. Well, he does say that the American scholar must not shy away from politics and should stand up to the crowd and speak out when, uh, when he sees something wrong. And he did that by the 1840s. He was a little slow to get involved he always hated slavery, but he was a little slow to get involved in uh, in the anti-slavery movement. But he did by the 1840s. Uh, did some speaking uh, on that writing. It's a, I mean, the individualism is really crucial to these uh, to these transcendentalists, uh, to Thoreau, and uh, and certainly to Emerson too. Uh, it's. I mean, he says this, I learned, he's quoting again, a, a philosopher named Pestalozzi. He says, I learned that no man in, in God's wide earth is either willing or able to help another man. Help must come from the bosom alone. Pretty stark statement. Yeah, I don't. I don't think he's saying avoid politics or avoid speaking out on political issues, but I think in a, we hear a lot about American individualism today. A lot of people are asserting their individuality, saying all sorts of things these days. Are they in Emerson, are they following Emerson's advice? I mean, not that they're reading him, but are they, uh, you think they're in that tradition? I don't know, because I'm struggling with the last paragraph. And if the world is nothing and man is all, and all of the world is inside of you, then all of the world is also inside of everybody else, which to me seems consistent with transcendentalism, that you respect the universality in your neighbor as much as yourself, which is possibly why so many transcendentalists were against slavery, because you have to respect the well, it wasn't Emerson like also a minister or a, a cleric of some kind, like it's the divinity and the other person is the same as you're no more or less divine than the person sitting next to you. So you have to respect each other and all of those universes are in you, which also I know is in Whitman that all of the, that he contains all of the universe. Like I know, I know that quote comes from Whitman, not Emerson, but it seems like a similar idea. So if you want to be respected, you have to respect the person next to you because you both contain all of the stars of God as he puts in here. Does that make sense? Did that make sense the way I said it? Because it made sense in my head, I promise. <laughs> Emerson was ordained a minister. He was in the Unitarian Church for a while, but he quit. Uh, and uh, because he did not want to, he felt that it was wrong to distribute the Lord's Supper. He, uh, he felt that everybody was divine. There was divinity everywhere. And he didn't want it localized to a particular sacrament in a church. 
So, and he also got in trouble speaking at the Harvard Divinity School a year or two after he did the American Scholar questioning the divinity of Jesus, which was not a popular position at the Harvard Divinity School. And they didn't invite him back, uh, at least for a long time. Um, Kara, you have a hand up. Yeah, well, when she was mentioning um, what she read, number 24 in Walt Whitman, um, I really liked that one because he says, whoever degrades another degrades me, and whatever is done or said returns at last to me. And then he keeps going, and then he talks about, like, um, through me, many long, dumb voices. And he talks about all these different people, prisoners, slaves, um, like all these people who have been oppressed at some point in time. And I feel like that's what he means. That's what we mean here through individualism with Emerson and with Whitman. It's not individualism as in like, I'm so good that I'm like, I should just kind of do my own thing and be by myself, like, and stand out amongst the crowd. But I think it's more of, I'm going to stand up and do what's right. That it's more of, I'm, I'm standing up and I'm being an individual because I'm not going along with the crowd to do the wrong thing. But I'm speaking for all these people who can't do that. I saw somebody else. I, I, when I talk about it, or Kara, you want to speak again? Oh, okay. Um, when I think about Emerson, I'm influenced by uh, a book that I read maybe 20 years ago or so called Habits of the Heart. It's by uh, Robert Bella and some other sociologists. And they try to analyze the American character and they break it down into four traditions. And one of which is, uh, they call it expressive individualism. And they identify Emerson and Thoreau as sort of the founders of this tradition. That it's not materialistic individualism. They're not saying just go out and make a lot of money. Clearly Emerson and they're not, these are not materialistic people at all, uh, but rather they value this self-expression, creativity, courage to be whoever you need to be, uh, to speak out on things, uh, and to, uh, you know, self-fulfillment, self-actualization, realization. Uh, and I think if, that's a, that's a kind of individualism that is still very much with us, I think, in, uh, in our own culture, uh, as is the more materialistic form of individualism too, which Emerson reacted against in Thoreau, the other, you know, the transcendentalists. Transcendental means that they, that the spiritual world, what you don't see with your senses or experience through your senses is more real and what you do experience through your senses. The spiritual world is the most, the spirituality within yourself and within the world is, is the most important thing. So, um, so I think individualism in America has, and at least that's the point of the book, Habits of the Heart, that it's, it's a good thing. It kind of makes the country what it is. If there is such a thing as the American character that they believe that's, the, the core ingredient, but there also are concerns that it's sometimes excessive. And uh, uh, do you see dangers of excess in Emerson's individualism, his form of expressive individualism? Maybe not. Okay, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I feel like I'm talking way too much. So you can, if other people have to say something, jump in. Um, well. I don't know if it's a danger, but if we're, so I'm reading the last paragraph of the Emerson essay again, which I read like years and years ago and have reread multiple times and maybe someday I'll get it. Um, if we only can learn from ourselves and completely disregard 
those who've come before, then aren't we also disregarding a, you know, a, a large percentage of voices? And so I think, and I'm, bear with me while I talk this out, like if you're willing to ignore some voices, whose voices do you ignore? And, you know, what if somebody misinterprets what Emerson's saying and they exclude people's voices from being heard? Who's that going to be? Um, I haven't really thought that whole thought out, but that's kind of the germ of the thought. Well, Emerson doesn't say that we shouldn't read earlier writers. In fact, he talks about that in, in the American Scholar, but he says you should read them and then move beyond them. Don't, be, don't just imitate them. Don't just be a slave to what the, what the earlier writers said. Uh, because remember, if I can find the quote, but uh, something about young men feel like they have to go, and he does say men all the time. Uh, young men have to feel like they have to spend all their time in libraries reading the works of Cicero and Bacon and John Locke, people like that. And what they don't realize is that when Cicero and Bacon and John Locke wrote their works, they were just young men in libraries too. So he's trying to, he's not saying disregard the past, but don't, don't just feel like you're stuck with it or, or you shouldn't do anything different or original. I, I think there, I'll just throw this out and you can think about it and then we'll move on and talk about Whitman. It, it, it worries me a little bit with Emerson's individualism that uh, how do you build a community out of that kind of individualism if we're all, it, it seems like it's based on a wonderful act of hope, profound act of hope that if we all just actualize ourselves and find the divinity within us and express that, automatically the world will get better. And I don't think that's the way Emerson lived. He did speak out against slavery and, you know, he, uh, but there's this kind of impatience almost with community building, with political process, with the, they call the sausage making of legislation uh, that worries me a little bit about that individualism. Yeah, he doesn't really talk a lot about um, working together, you know, yeah. he, he, he talks about, you know, coming up with your own ideas, you know, not just depending upon someone else's and, and doesn't really focus on community. It didn't appear to me. I mean, even the very last sentence says a nation of men will for the first time exist because each believes himself inspired by the design divine soul, which also inspires all men. Well, if everybody thinks that they're speaking for God, then everybody's right, nobody's wrong. And how do you get, how, how, how do you get along when you disagree with each other? You know, how do you, how do you work it out if, if everybody is, um, is inspired by that divine soul and you just gotta live with it. I, it uh, yes, did you wanna I kind of feel like that's where we are right now. Everybody's got their own set of everybody's got their own set of, of um, truths and nobody else is gonna convince me that what I believe is right. Um, yes. We're certainly not in a good state place right now with everybody thinking that way. Well, I, I think I agree a, a bit with that. I, what I see is there's no room for compromise. You're, you're standing on your own, on his instincts. Each single man stands on his own instincts. And, you know, how do you work things out between you? Um, the, I don't think necessarily that that was, um, his intent, but it can be read that way. Mm -hmm. The compromise is wrong. Well, That's and it's it. funny you say that because I read that last sentence and the most important word in that sentence to me is the also. 
because a nation of men will for the first time exist because each man believes in self etc etc cetera, et cetera, but also inspires all men so i think that's where the compromise comes from is because everyone if everyone thinks they're divinely inspired and everyone isn't divinely inspired by the logic in that sentence everyone is also divinely inspired so you kind of have to listen to what they're saying and respect what they're saying does that make sense at least that's how i read that sentence maybe i'm way off it kind of reminds me of when um the young boy goes and tries to uh, borrow a hoe from Uncle Lot, and Uncle Lot says, geez, I, I don't really like the inconvenience of this. Why don't you have your own hoe, and so on. And then uh, at the end of the day, we, if as a community, we, we need to be individuals and use our own and till our own land, but we can share tools, and uh, without the community there, it makes it uh, more difficult. So, yeah. she might well, I think Stowe would be more interested in community maybe than Emerson. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. Yes. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good point to make. Uh, the women yeah. writers. Sorry. Go ahead. Somebody. Yeah, I was just going to say that the the part in uh, the Emerson piece where he talks about the parts of the body and how societies become so mm -hmm. fragmented that those pieces kind of don't come back together and work together well that fits with what you're saying there too that he's, he doesn't seem to be promoting that coming together in a collective sense but more the individual right yeah i don't i don't want to like push people too far but it, it's like eight o'clock now so we should like finish the last couple of questions yeah let's talk about <laughs> So, do you think he succeeded in becoming the American voice that Emerson called for? So, I don't really... I haven't read a whole lot of Walt Whitman. I probably read some in high school and some in college, but I haven't like done it for fun or anything. Uh, but I really do, for whatever reason, I really liked the movie Dead Poet Society. And so the, the barbaric Yelp thing, I was like, oh wait, that's the Walt Whitman line from the Dead Poet Society. But the, 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 it really does kind of like demonstrate that whole, you've got to, be yourself and do your thing and, you know, yell across the rooftops kind of uh, a thing. And so in that respect, at least that part of the poem really did kind of come back to that, you know, American voice, do your thing kind of voice. Agree? Disagree? Go for it. I don't think any other poet of the day would be would be using the word would be proud to say that he was sounding his barbaric yaw. I think that's pretty distinctively Whitman. Um, we got a chat in here. Yeah. The barbaric yelp thing from Dead Poets is just the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the poem that they quote all the time by Whitman, Oh Captain, My Captain, in that movie, is, a, is uh, it was is maybe his most popular poem in his lifetime. And he said, I'm kind of sorry I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my best poem at all. And, uh, and, and if you've read, you know, if you read the sections of Song of Myself, you can see they're not really anything like, oh, Captain, my Captain. It's much, much, much more formal and traditional than Barb. You ready to speak? Well, I think one of the things that he does, and this might bring our discussion full circle, uh, Chris, if you could get those uh, two other paintings up, the uh, George Caleb Bingham and William Sidney Mount. We could look at those for a minute. Not that one, that's uh, 
one B. Yeah, that one. That's good. That's a good one to start with. Um, we were talking, and this applies to what we were saying about Stowe too earlier, I think, because uh, these are scenes from common life. Whitman gives you the big sweep in that catalog that somebody mentioned before, uh, where he goes all around North America. He gives you the big sweep, the, the Hudson River kind of approach, but then he zeroes in on small incidents that, that may have, and he may have been influenced by these painters called the genre painters, G-E-N-R-E, who painted scenes from common life, ordinary scenes, uh, and yet sometimes built into them a lot more than, than what might meet the eye. Uh, this one by William Sidney Mount. William Sidney Mount knew Whitman. They were, they were acquainted. Uh, Whitman admired his work. Uh, and uh, they were both from Long Island. And he had uh, Mount, this painting was commissioned by a friend of Mount's who had also grown up on Long Island and probably learned to fish from black servants uh, in the, uh, in the house. So when you start thinking about the, the racial implications of this poem, here's this probably well-to-do white boy sitting in the back of the boat while uh, the black woman is doing the work and maybe teaching him how to spear eels uh, off, uh, off Long Island. Uh, so this is kind of that scene from Common Life, the ordinary scene, but sometimes these painters pack to it. Let's look at the next one too. Fur traders. Uh, yeah, there it is. Fur traders going down the Missouri. This is George Caleb Bingham, another one of these genre painters. Um, and that's not the original title of the uh, of the painting. Uh, he he wanted to call it French trader and his half-breed son. So again, the racial dynamics are there. There's more, uh, more going on in, in some of the, you know, some, some of them, some of the genre paintings are just kind of sentimental glorifications or idealizations of, of rural life. But there, I think there's more going on in some of these. And I think they had an influence on with if you, in some of his sections where he zeroes in on a particular scene, the marriage of the trapper and he's marrying the Indian girl. Uh, the, uh, the runaway slave came to my house and stopped outside. And he goes, gives you a, a good deal of detail about that scene, these vignettes, these snapshots of, uh, of American life that are like genre paintings. Um, and I think that's, I think Whitman, and I think you could argue that Stowe in her own way is, is doing that uh, in, her, uh, in her story, Uncle Lot, or at least an earlier version of that. So I think that's part of the, part of the Americanness maybe, and part of the genius of Whitman and his, uh, uh, some of his originality to, uh, to do that. Um, other points, about Whitman's poetry that struck you as either noteworthy, or particularly American, or noteworthy in the context context of what we've been talking about. Talking about. Well, at least Whitman acknowledges that there's women in the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. He says, I'm yes. the poet of the woman, the same as the man. That's a big point ahead of Emerson, isn't it? Who always talks about, in very male terms, about, the, uh, about his idea of the scholar. I am the poet of the woman, says Whitman, the same as the man. And I say that it's as great to be a woman as to be a man. And I say there is nothing greater than the mother of men. Uh, so, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's new. <laughs> We haven't seen that from the male writers uh, in, in, mid in the mid 19th century. He also says, and I think somebody quoted this before, I resist anything better than my own diversity. So he is profoundly aware of American regions and of the diversity of races in, uh, in the US. Um, 
yeah, it seems like section 16, you know, just spends a whole time to, you know, Northerner, Southerner, all the different types of uh, Native Americans and uh, the, the different states and different types of, uh, you know, how all in there's a lot going on in America, in this new country. Did Whitman travel? I mean, had he been to all these places or is he just talking from, uh, from book knowledge? He visited New Orleans as a young guy, uh -huh. uh, fairly young man, uh, and traveled some in New England. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware that, that, he had, that by this time in his life, at least, he had traveled to the West. Just curious, you know. Yeah. Some, uh, Barbara was asking the question, what was the other figure in the water in the Bingham painting? Was it a cat or a fish or a submerged person? Uh, it's a cat. It looks yeah, like a cat. cat. I, I was noticing that because the other picture had a had a dog in the in the boat, and this one had a cat on on the. On yeah, I think that's a leash <laughs> right there. Yeah, the cat's leashed. With all the fish in the water, you know. <laughs> well, it could be a leash, or it could just be a continuation of that branch in the back there. Mm. Um, yeah. Is that the question you were asking, Barbara? Are we? Are we answering your question? Or? <laughs> I think we can see Whitman also doing something on uh, that, that really using an earlier source in the way that Emerson encouraged the American scholar to use earlier sources. There's that uh, line about uh, I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check with original energy, unscrew the locks from the doors, unscrew the doors themselves from their jams. Uh, that's a reference to William Blake uh, in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, who said this, and if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite, for man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. And that phrase, the doors of perception, of course, is what the doors, that's why they chose their name. The, uh, the rock group picked the name the doors because of that, mm. and their effort to break on through to the other side. Um, so I think that, but that's the use of the source because uh, Blake said, cleanse the doors of perception. Whitman says, unscrew the locks from the doors. In fact, unscrew the doors themselves. We don't even need doors. Uh, so he's, he's trying to go, go William Blake one better, which is kind of hard to do sometimes. Um, the takeaway, last question. Are there connections between any of this, anything we've been talking about tonight really and the world we're living in today? Okay, so I'm going to give a short answer, and it's a short answer because it's loaded and there's lots of things, but, um, and I'm, we're not talking about liberals and conservatives, we're not talking about Democrats and Republicans, we're just saying that overall in the United States, it seems like there are some people who want to expand and really, you know, demonstrate the diversity of the United States, and there are other people who want to contract and not talk about the diversity of the United States. And so I think that's kind of the, the dichotomy that we're seeing today. You know, do we want to have all of these voices or do we want to limit it to the voices that are important to you? So that's my take on it. I think that's a great answer. Um, we still need originality, I think. We need, we, but we need community too. We need to find ways for the voices to talk to each other and listen to each other. Um, and I think Whitman and Stowe probably do a better job of that than Emerson, um, at least based on some of the things 
I've been thinking about and written about with him anyway. Um, we need scholars who address social concerns and don't live in ivory towers. Um, we need to realize that there was a time when American voices weren't seen as necessary. And now many of those voices we're hearing from the margins of our society, we better listen to them because they're necessary too. Uh, uh, and uh, as I, what we've looked at here is kind of the, um, the United States' post-colonial period. How do you emerge from being a colonized country into one that, that develops its own identity? Um, from a Native American perspective, they were being colonized. And we'll, that was a dilemma for the Native American writer Zitka Lassa, who we'll, we will read later this spring. Uh, what language should she write in? Should she write in English, the language of the people who were colonizing her people and trying to destroy their culture? Or write in her, uh, in her uh, own language? Well, she chose to write in English in an effort to save her people. But this is a dilemma for the post-colonial writer or the writer who is writing from a colonial perspective. Similarly, we'll look at Chinua Achebe later uh, in the fall, Nigerian writer had to decide what language should I write in? What language will, should I like write in the language of the oppressor, the British people who colonized my country? Um, and he decided finally that he should because that's where he could have the most power, but he had to remake the language, make it his own somehow. And, uh, and I think that's what we're seeing so that it wasn't just the Queen's English, it was Igbo influenced African English. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing some of these American writers struggling with trying to do. You know, we could just write and sound like the Brits, but maybe we don't wanna do that. And uh, so I guess that's my, those are my closing comments. Anybody else wanna add anything? Barbara. Yeah, um, yeah, okay, I'm not muted. Um, this is a takeoff on what I wrote to you, uh, John, but I, for the first time, I was starting to have a problem with uh, Achebe taking his title from Yates and wondering whether that immediately places him in a secondary subsidiary position. Well, that's something we can talk about when we do a Chebby, but I would say not necessarily because he's uh, he's trying to exp his take on why things are falling apart isn't necessarily Yates's, and or it, is, it isn't Yates's, and uh, I think he's re I think writers always find themselves in some kind of dialogue with earlier writing, and I think by using Yeats's, uh, Yeats, uh, the taking his title from Yeats and then writing something completely different. Uh, he's, he's dragging it into its, uh, into his own, uh, for his own purposes. And I think, you know, it's kind of like what, Whit, what I saw Whitman doing with, uh, with William Blake here. Um, but it's the door jam and all that. Pardon? I said the door yeah. jam and all yeah. that. Yeah, unscrewed okay. doors. Um, that I think <laughs> things falling apart to William Ye Butler Yeats had to do with his private mythology and his strange vision of the world. Uh, <laughs> things falling apart for for Chinua Achebe were a whole lot different from that. And that's the story he wants to tell. Well, this was my first time and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I might come back. Please do. Great to have you. <laughs> hope you hope you come back. Yes, please do. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we're going to go ahead and wrap things up again. Thank you all for joining us for our discussion series tonight. And then, yes, go back to our website and look at uh, next month. I don't remember the date. It's always the first Wednesday, 7 p.m. We're going to stay online for this particular discussion series. 
Our other discussion series, we will do a hybrid version so you can come to the house or do it online. And our lecture series, we are doing hybrid as well. But for this particular series, we're going to keep it online exclusively. And next month is Stories Within the Story. So mm -hmm. Harriet's Ghost Story. And stories that characters within Uncle Tom's cabin tell to save their lives, basically. Uh, okay. All right. And I'll have so. a wonderful rhetorician from Xavier University, Renee Fry, to be the co-host. Okay. So go figure out what you what, what you want to sign up for with our website. Uh, don't forget that we are starting our regular operating hours on Saturday. And uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Great Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Oh.